I'm gonna read you a bit of Greg's review. Oh, okay. It might seem it might seem cruel, but uh, <laughs> so Spider-Man: Web of Shadows is redundant and repetitive. Seemingly, every mandatory mission has you assisting X number of Shield evacs, stopping X number of symbiotes, or attacking X number of whatever. It gets old fast. Yeah. Do you feel like Greg has a point about the repetition of, of the game? Oh, uh, you know, I guess maybe that that is. Chris Scholes was the studio lead at Shaba Games, developers behind titles like Grind Sessions, Shrek Super Slam, and Spider-Man Web of Shadows. Over a year ago, I made a video which set out to find what makes a good Spider-Man game. And during this discussion, I was quite harsh on Web of Shadows, which prompted an outcry from the game's diehard fans, who, unsurprisingly for a YouTube comment section, proceeded to rip me a new digital asshole. But I was curious to speak to the man behind Web of Shadows. I wanted to find out the story behind the game's development and that of the studio that made it. So I sat down with Chris, who told me he first got started in the industry at California-based developer Toys for Bob, working on Pandemonium, a 3D platformer for the original PlayStation. Believe it or not, this is at the launch of the PlayStation 1. Crystal Dynamics, that's who we worked with. It was between us and Crash Bandicoot to become the, the mascot for the PS1, but we lost out or chose not to, which was a mistake. Pandemonium is not getting a PS4 remaster 20 years later or so. No, is it really? No, no, it's just a it reference. <laughs> reference. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Sorry to, that... sorry, sorry to catch you. With just a few years of experience, Chris made the bold decision to leave Toys for Bob and start his very own studio, Shaba Games. I just cannot believe we were able to pull it off because it just seems so likely to fail. But, um, you know, really, I, I, the, the group of us, we only had about two years of experience in making games, but we thought we knew everything. And so uh, decided to break off and form a new company, which was Shaba. We kind of just bootstrapped it for the first nine months or so, uh, making a wipeout on a hoverboard type game called Slip Groove. And that went pretty much nowhere. And right when we were about out of money, we decided to instead make it a hoverboard, let's make it a skateboard. And, um, and that really took off. And that turned into Grind Sessions, is that correct? Grind Session, that's right. The, the inappropriately named Grind Session. The trouble with Grind Session was we were about six months behind Tony Hawk. Every time that we made progress, we'd, we'd see something from them and it was just awesome. And, you know, they had won Game of the Show at E3 and the pressure was really on us. And I remember going to the X Games that year uh, in September, uh, right before Tony Hawk launched. And Tony Hawk landed the 900, which was the impossible trick. And there's 40,000 people chanting Tony Hawk's name. And I looked at my the other partner, Tom, and just said, we're screwed. <laughs> we pretty much got our asses kicked. But as luck would have it, Activision came calling shortly afterwards saying, Grand Session was awesome. We want you guys to work on games for us. We did the, the PS1 version of Tony, Tony Hawk 3. And we also made a game called uh, Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX. And that did really well. And, uh, and then we made Wakeboarding Unleashed, which is still to this date the greatest wakeboarding game ever made. Might be the only one. So in a way, you ended up sort of joining the enemy with Tony Hawk. Yes, entirely we did. It worked out great though. After completing the PlayStation 1 port of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, Activision acquired Shaba Games, who then went on to develop ports for the Tony Hawk series and a handful of original titles. The studio's most peculiar game, however, would turn out to be 2005's Shrek Super Slam. The game initially released to little fanfare, but years later, seemingly out of nowhere, it resurfaced online. We had a funny phone call about a year ago from, from one of the guys who used to work with us. So Shrek Super Slam was kind of a Smash Brothers Power Stone type brawler, or mostly forgotten until the internet found it. Apparently, there's a, a thriving esports community built around the game. Couldn't believe it. Ten years later, we went on Reddit, and there's thousands of people playing Shrek Super Slam competitively, and that was a trip. It was pretty incredible. So we were obviously big fans of Spider-Man 2, and you know that was the first real open-world 
uh, Spider-Man game and it got the swing. It was so awesome. It's so great. But the thing that in our mind that never was really captured was uh, you never really fought the way you always imagined Spider-Man being able to fight, right? Super dynamically, swinging through the air, knocking people up, basically drop kicking them, webbing them in the air, pulling them to you, slamming them to the ground. These are all things that we want to do. It's like, let's do what Spider-Man 2 did for web swinging. Let's do that for fighting. You know, we want to be able to fight on the ground, on the side of the building, and in the air. And throughout the game, there's like excellent moments of that that just really kind of captures exactly the way we thought Spider-Man should, should fight. Combat was very ambitious. Did you always set out to make such an ambitious combat system? Really, that was the one thing we really wanted to do. And so we spent the bulk of our development just trying to get that right. It's the age old story that you never have enough time or money to make the thing you want to do. And that was definitely the case with Web of Shadows where you can't just work on the fighting aspect because there's a whole open world. You have to populate with interesting stuff and bringing all the characters to life. There's just so much more to it to, to make it a game. The collaboration with, with Treyarch, can you maybe walk me through how they got involved and, and what role each of the studios played through development? So really up until this point, Spider-Man was Treyarch's baby, right? They had done, did they do all of the games? I think they might have done all of the games, all the Spider-Man games up until we took Web of Shadows. You know, I think there was probably a little bit of fatigue inside the studio. You know, Spider-Man 3 was not really critically acclaimed and I think everybody's looking for a fresh start, um, but the entire code base was built off of the Treyarch engine. And so having them involved was really key because there's just so much tribal knowledge when you have a, a homegrown engine that it would have been kind of hopeless for us to try to do it just completely on our own. You had 17 months to from start to finish of development, is that right? Yeah. Which is, 17 months is by any means a very short window. How did the team manage to, to make a game in 17 months? Um, it was a lot of cocaine, really late. No, I'm just kidding. We just tried to prioritize the right stuff, right? We were, one thing, we were really highly motivated to make something awesome. We really saw this as like a huge shot for us. And early on, we identified exactly what it was that we wanted to focus on. And we just did our best. You know, I don't want to slam Spider-Man 3, but Spider-Man 3 was everything in the kitchen sink game. There was so much in there. And so we just, one of the first weeks was just, making a, a huge list of all the things we were going to cut from Spider-Man 3 to just streamline the game as much as we could. Zach made a, an image of what we were trying to do, which was it was a bridge being built with a train about to come over it and a plane landing on top of the train. And that's really the way we thought of the project was like everything's coming in all at once and we just have to try to make the best of it. What would you have done if you'd had more development time? Say you had an extra 12 months. What are the main things that you would have addressed from Web of Shadows or given more resources to? Oh, in all honesty, there were a couple features that marketing really wanted that we think just made the game worse. So there's a whole kind of red suit, black suit decision tree that they wanted, which is like player choice. And, and player choice is one of those things that's Every time you do a focus test, it always scores high because it sounds good. So there isn't like a huge feature that we wish we could. Okay, there's one feature that we had in that was awesome that we took out at the last second. And that was kind of like a five star Grand Theft Auto mode where you could play as uh, the black suit and just cause carnage on the city. And that was incredible. You know, I think we made something that when people go back and look at it, they, they see the real strengths of the core. Right. And, you know, I think you see that in subsequent games. People really started adopting a lot of the way that we did the fighting. I think we made a, a, an important contribution to the to the legacy of Spider-Man games. Web of Shadows releases, development finishes. What is the team's feeling upon release? How they how do you think the team is feeling about the game? The game, when you saw somebody awesome at it and playing it, you're like super proud because it's just if somebody actually takes the time to learn the game, you could just do these beautiful things that just are so epic and awesome. When you saw somebody that had no idea, that's where it's like, oh God, like we could have done a lot better. Depending on who was reviewing the game, they could either make the game look amazing or like total dog shit. People were proud of what we did, but it was just, God, what could we have done given another year? Critical reception was swaying in both directions. You had 
bad reviews, but you also had some good ones. So you received, I mean, I'm sure you know this already. I know a 5.5 from IGN and an 8.0 from GameSpot. Yeah, look, there was IGN, that's Greg Miller, right? That one was a killer because that came out first. And you look at the gameplay videos and it's like, it's clear that he didn't even play the game, right? I'm going to read you a bit of Greg's review. Oh, okay. It might seem... It might seem cruel, but uh, <laughs> so Spider-Man Web of Shadows is redundant and repetitive. Seemingly every mandatory mission has you assisting X number of shield evacs, stopping X number of symbiotes or attacking X number of whatever. It gets old fast. Yeah. Do you feel like Greg has a point about the repetition of, of the game? We had these missions. We wanted to kind of have like a wow flavor where it's like, how do we reward somebody for just casually going around the city and having fights? So there were some kind of ridiculous ones, like kill 500 peds. It was just like, oh my God, it's, it, you could look at that as like a, a huge slog. But we really wanted you just kind of, in a wow way, it's like you, you're, you're collecting those and you don't even know that you're doing it. Right when you finish one bar, you'd be almost done with another one. The things that suffered the most in the game were the variety of missions because of all the reasons we just talked about. In our minds, it's not a flawless game, but I think if you read the GameSpot review, you go, you could see that it was really this jewel that just needed uh, polishing. I'm glad you mentioned it because I've got some of Carolyn Petit's review from GameSpot as well. Carolyn Petit said, Web of Shadows is a game that, while not free of blemishes, is a super powered blast from start to finish. So it was clear that there were people who loved the game and were able to see it from a, an objective point of view, but that didn't necessarily translate to sales. Oh no, yeah, it did not sell well. What kind of impact do bad reviews, good reviews have on the team's morale and then respectively sales? Oh, it's, oh man, it it's obviously sucks. Uh, I honestly, I feel like the, the team takes the review stuff a little more personally because it's something that's, you know, really much more in their control. How it does commercially, there's so many factors that go into that. It's hard to take full responsibility for that. You want better than an 80, <laughs> you know, in general, Metacritic. So yeah, it was, it was kind of sucky, honestly. We knew it was a tough call because, you know, Spider-Man 3, I think was like a 60 ranked game. So we knew this was like getting 20 points more would be almost impossible. But, um, you know, we tried. So when we started out, the goal was always, can you make something that makes $100 million every year? And that was Tony Hawk, right? Then the bar went up to, can you make something that makes 250 a year? To, can you make something that makes 500 a year? To, is this title capable of making a billion dollars every single year? And when you do that, you boil it down to, okay, we'll just make Call of Duty, right? And you look at Activision stock price and you say, well, that was a pretty goddamn good strategy, right? Because focus on fewer titles and make them massive. You know, it's a lot easier to make one title that sells a billion than 10 titles that sell a hundred million. So, you know, that's just the state of the industry uh, on the console space. So you have, you know, eight juggernaut titles that take $150 million to make and with the hope that they all make a billion dollars. Um, when you do that, there's a set of musical chairs, right? And Shaba was one of like the seven studios within Activision that got either absorbed by other studios or closed down. I guess you could probably classify Shaba as like a double A game studio, if that's a fair assessment. Not in a disparaging way at all, but it was kind of that middle ground in, in gaming where there were just tons and tons of titles that you wouldn't necessarily classify as a big Call of Duty blockbuster. The industry is like you said, it's changed. And now pretty much no games of that caliber get made anymore. It is sad, isn't it? I look at specifically games like, like uh, Tony Hawk, right? Where it's like Activision's not gonna do it because it's not gonna make a billion dollars. But a really awesome skateboarding game would still make 50 to 100 million dollars, right? And so where's, where are those? Where are those titles that, you know, the, the, the middle ground? You think that there's opportunity there? I would think so. Shaba Games was eventually closed in October 2009, just one year after Web of Shadows released. Chris then went on to form independent studio Free Range Games, which last year released its latest title, Labyrinth, into Steam Early Access. I could tell that Chris had really fond memories of his time at Shaba Games, so I closed our discussion by asking him how he wanted people to remember the studio. 
you know what? We got a nice little cult following, honestly. And uh, honestly, the thing that I'm most proud of is, so through the course of Shaba, we probably had, I don't know, three or 400 people work at Shaba and uh, through the 12 years that we were around. And, you know, I get calls all the time still from guys saying it was just the best job that they ever had. So I'm more into that, knowing that it's like, we made a place where people could be creative, feel like they're working with the best people in the industry, and people are really proud of their time at Java. So I think that's the coolest legacy for us. Hey guys, thanks so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and subscribe if you're feeling the vibes. I'll see you next time.